Okay, so welcome everybody. And we are about to start our third session of Seed to Supper at Home. So once again, as a reminder, just keep your mic muted until you're called upon and have your chat bar ready to type in any questions or to read other people's comments or questions. And today's topic is caring for your growing garden. I don't think I can make it. Um, there you go. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, tonight we have a few different, well, one different presenter. And for technical support, we have Leah Gorman and Elizabeth Records. And I, Judith Kenner, will be your chat moderator again. And then our instructors will be Ruby Moon, Leah Gorman, and Elizabeth Records. So for the root cellar, I just wanted to let you guys know that um, I did do some research on Neil's question from last Thursday about growing fruit trees in pots. And that information should have been mailed, emailed to you um, by Elizabeth. And so if you didn't get it, please let us know. And if in the future, I mean, if we have any other root cellar questions, we'll kind of handle them in the same way we will um, try to answer them as best we can using the expertise that we can find and get the information out to you. So we're now going to start talking a little bit about your garden planning, um, which I hope you've had a chance to work on a little bit. You should have all received those packets in the mail by now with your books and the Territorial Seed Catalog and the Garden Resources Guide and perhaps a few other things. So please let us know, um, write in, uh, me a note in the chat box if you did not receive it so that we can make sure that you get it. And in your books, there was more information about garden planning and a little bit more detail than some graph paper. So we wanted to have just a quick little check-in to see how you guys are doing on your garden planning. So um, I asked earlier if anybody had any comments on the chat. Oh, somebody, oh, that was Elizabeth. <laughs> um, so anybody else want to add to the comments that we have on the chat about garden planning and how your experience has been? And Elizabeth, you can, next slide. There we go. Okay, well, I guess this either means that you don't have any questions or that you haven't done it yet or that you haven't received your materials yet or something of that nature. So, um, or if you would like, if somebody wants to talk about it, send me a chat and we can unmute you so that you can talk. Judith, okay. there's, a, there's a note from Neil in the chat. Note. Yes. Wife and I have been out in the yard planning, but haven't solidified where going to go. Oh, somebody on you. Uh, yeah, we just, we have like on the, the southeast facing side, uh, it's a it's along the road. So we're trying to figure out like, you know, do, I, do we want like several like three by nine little rows or something like that out there? Mm -hmm. uh, so we're still in, in the very early planning phase of like where it's going to go. I mean, we have a pretty good idea of what we want to plant because we had gardens in, uh, previously, but um, this will be a lot more serious because we did buy a home and, you know, uh -huh. and whatnot. So uh, yeah, it's, it's exciting. I mean, I, 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 you know, I've done it before, but it'll be a lot more fun. I think doing it at my own home. Yeah. 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 And I think that process of getting out there and looking at, you know, watching things, what happens with the sunlight, what happens with the water, that whole first year you're in a place, like that's yeah. where you're going to learn so much that's going to help you in all your future years. Right. We're checking at different times of the day, be like, is it sunny now? It's like, you know, we're trying to find out like, you know, when the sun, I mean, 
we know about where the sun is generally, but you know exactly where we're wanting to put the put our our little plots. We're trying to say, you know, is it going to be sunny here in you know you know six months as well? So it's like things like that. Great, sounds like you're on the right track. <laughs> Okay, then we have a comment from Brianna saying, we are planning to get soil soon so we can get started. Haven't made a solid plan yet. And then I think I have a new message. Oh, from Malaya, I already started planting. So far I have purple cauliflower and dinosaur kale. Yay, good for you. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, well then I, we will... I did put a question in there and, and, and I'm sorry it didn't show up. This is Dodai. Mm -hmm. Is it all right that I talk? Sure. Okay. Yeah, so I'm, I'm excited about this and um, one of the reasons is that I really kind of need the, the check-in as I go along or I, I kind of get sidetracked. Um, and I'm, I'm really trying hard to make sure that I don't end up doing like a whole bunch of stuff at once because mm -hmm. my experience is that I will not follow through. Mm -hmm. um, so my, my other problem is that I, I'm having a problem with my back and so I'm going to have to call somebody in to do the labor part of it and I haven't done that yet. And so there's kind of extra organization stuff that I don't normally need to deal with. Um, but I, I pretty much decided to keep it pretty small this year, but start working on beds for next year. Mm -hmm. Great, and do you have any questions for us? Um, I do actually, um, and that's for the, um, when you do the composting or the layered beds or whatever, you do the brown material. I have something that I've been wondering if it's um, good for this. I, I assume it is, but, but I don't want to, do that um, and it's called uh, it's some kind of bedding for stall animals it's like it's like sawdust that's been um, pelletized mm -hmm. is that something that would count as brown material I'm not an expert on that anybody else want to handle that one so Dodai is it something that's been already installed so it's um, has um, additional uh, organic matter in it or is this like brand new stuff? Well the stuff that I have is probably something I can't use because I think you know it, it, it got um, exposed to moisture and that makes it swell up um, so I'm, I'm assuming I can't use that but just it would be new stuff I, I pro probably if it's if it's was new and it got wet, I mean, it's going to get wet in the garden. So I would think it would be fine for um, brown material. Shika, if you're on and um, you have any experience um, with using um, stall kinds of materials um, or pellets, uh, I would look, just look at the ingredients and what it is. Sometimes um, uh, you have to add a little more nitrogen um, to get things um, rolling a, a little bit better. And if you have a, um, access to compost um, that's active, um, sometimes that's nice to add into the layers as well. Okay, just to get things going? Yeah, yeah, because okay. you want them to um, be bioavailable for your plants. So okay. if, it's, if it's like a material that's like more wood pellet like sometimes um, they take longer to br break down and sometimes it's nice to um, have that process go fast. Yeah, I'm just assuming the... Yeah. Sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say just a comment on animal bedding type stuff. I keep chickens and I do add, when I clean out the chicken coop, it's a mixture of wood shavings and chicken manure. And I do add that to compost that I process for a really long time. So it breaks down any bacteria in the chicken manure but that sort of high carbon material that's made of wood shavings goes really well when you have a nitrogen source like the chicken manure. Okay, all right. So this is, let me just throw in a little bit. Um, Dodai, when, especially since the brown layers and green layers, you're doing a lot of different layers alternating. There's really, you know, if, as long as you don't make that your entire brown layer, 
I think you're totally fine. And then you also mentioned that you're kind of prepping your beds for next year. And yes. so you're not going to really plant in it right away. I think everything would break down and be great for our next year's beds when you layer with that stuff. But like Jennifer said too, just double check that they didn't put anything, any strange sort of chemical in it, but probably they didn't. And I think it would break down really well, as long as it's just part of the, you know, a bunch of different materials. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. Okay, so I guess we should start with our topic, our first topic of the day. So Elizabeth, there we go, um, caring for your growing garden. And so we're gonna start with watering and then protecting young plants and weeds and insects. So our first instructor is Ruby Moon, who will talk to you about watering. And I have to have um, Elizabeth doing the slide. So here, you'll hear me say slide every once in a while. Uh, so you saw this slide last week, I guess. And so maybe you want to remember what are the four basic things that plants need to thrive? And you could write this down in your chat. Um, one thing they're missing here is they need you. <laughs> That's the fifth thing that they need. So um, if you're not present, then your garden will not thrive. So slide. Okay, so here we are with, and I think you probably touched on this also, your um, soil. Um, most of the soil here in the Willamette Valley is clay. If you're lucky, you might have some loamy soil, or if you have clay, you might have already amended it in some way, or you're planning to. Um, the clay soil is good because it does hold water. However, the water doesn't doesn't drain very fast. If you've had a good rain here and you have clay yard, you'll see little pools in your yard. Um, so the different kinds of um, soil will ask you for different kinds of watering. And that's what this slide is about. So let's talk about how do we water gardens. Um, and I actually don't have a slide. For, we don't have a slide for this one, so I'm just going to talk about it. Um, so my feeling is the first and foremost is you really have to know your garden. So no matter what you do for watering, you should be going out every day and personally engaging in your garden in some way. That's the only way you're really going to know whether the plants are thriving or what you should be doing in the future. Um, so because we, where we lived here, we hardly ever have rain. I shouldn't say that we don't have rain because we did have rain, didn't we, last summer? I think we did. Um, but normally we have dry summers. And so that means we have to provide water. And usually, and seeing we've had a dry, three dry years, I guess, um, we're gonna be starting out with water and early on. Um, so when we water, we wanna to remember to water deeply and frequently. Uh, generally they say to water two, three times a week and do it deep. Um, but if it's really hot or windy, I would say you want to do it more often. Again, it, let's go to the next slide and we'll show you. Um, yes, this next slide here. You, that you can spot check um, your garden, just your finger. You can go in and go down a little ways and see um, how wet your soil is down below. Don't ever look at the top because the top will dry out. Uh, and then uh, if you did get your books, um, I found a really, really good thing on page 72 at the top left, um, first column. And it talks about getting your, taking your garden soil and putting it in, uh, um, in a container. And I, my suggestion, I found this, would be to have a container that's clear, maybe a glass container, and at least this big. Um, and fill it with soil and then have it where you're watering. And you'll see if it, if you water and if it's still dry down here, you haven't watered enough. This is a really good, uh, it, I, I was very impressed by that piece of information. Anyhow, so I would suggest doing that to really find out um, what you should be doing for your watering. So slide. Okay, this would be the way a lot of us will start out in our gardens probably, is using a hose with a nozzle on it and um, getting right to the roots of the um, plants. 
so one of the things I want to talk to you about is that when you use a nozzle, this was good because it shows that there's several different settings on it. I always look for a nozzle head that has a mist, a shower, and a soaker. When you're working with seeds, when you first bring them in, the mist helps a lot to use on seeds. The shower you use often for everything. And then the soaker I will use if I'm doing a whole bed and I want to get it really wet. I just lay the I lay it down. Um, and I also here's where I want to show you some things I use. This is, I've kind of gone to this kind of a, it's from, from uh, Radius. Uh, I love these. And they're a little spendy, but I've, it's turned out they work really well because they have lots of settings, but you can also put it down on the ground and leave it like this and it becomes a, oh, maybe you can't see it. If you, you can put it on the ground on the surface and then it becomes your shower too. And then the other thing you can do with that that I do is I, I use these um, on off things on all my hoses. You know, if you, anybody's worked with quick releases, you've seen these before. So if you have an on off thing, you can adjust the flow so you can have less pressure if you want not to be spraying so much, or you can have more pressure if you want to spray a lot. The other thing I hook up to my all my hoses are the um, hand timers. These this real, I mean, I know that a lot of nurseries use these too. These work great and they're not that expensive. You can find them on sale. So those, that's my show and tell. Um, I guess, oh, and then the best time to water is early in the morning. Don't ever water in the hot of the day. You'll burn your leaves and, and um, or you can, in the evening is okay too, but really early morning is best. Uh, so slide. Watering methods. Okay, we just talked about a bunch of those already. So I showed you some of the tools that I use. Um, hand watering, you'll probably start out with it. There's, a, there's no waste usually. It's a lot of work, depending on how big your garden is. If you're starting out small, it's not a lot of work. You, sooner or later, I mean, like, of course, I finally went to it. Oh, dear, I've lost my tool. Oh, well, it is the drip irrigation. I finally, I've, all my beds are on drip irrigation. And, um, and I've done a big thing with uh, timers. This timer will do four. And something I love about this one is it's got, this comes off. So you can actually take this inside at night where you can see and program it inside. You don't have to sit there here and do it, which is what I've done in the past. This works great. I mean, I have bought and own a bunch of these, but this is the best I've found. So um, you can also do like really inexpensive watering with these the jugs and just poke holes and it's a lot of work. It's, but when you get tired of doing that, then just cut out the bottom of it and use it as a um, little greenhouse. You can take the top off the airflow. So for your seedlings, anyhow. So there are ways. Uh, and in your book does talk about drip irrigation and sprinklers. And um, you can also use soaker hoses. They also have a hose that's um, like a soaker hose. And these work on only linear plantings a soaker hose that has holes in it and you can adjust that with that on off switch that i showed you then you can adjust the flow so you get different amounts of um water and i think that's it can you advance it please so the different plants have different needs so we did just talk about the um seedlings that you want to miss them and you want to do it every day they have to be kept moist um, you don't want to use too much power on them because otherwise you might take all the soil off and the seeds go flying and then you don't know where they are. So, um, either the misting or gently with the, um, shower. And, uh, there, you have different kinds of plants that grow with deep roots. Some grow with deep roots and some grow shallow roots normally. So it's nice if you put them all in one bed. So like your parsnips, your tomatoes, and your squashes all have deep roots. So if you have them in the same bed and you're 
using the same watering together, then it's easier to keep track of that. Those are the deeper rooted things. But you, if you water anything deep and it doesn't need to be deep, it's not gonna go deep. Plants know how they wanna grow. So shallow rooted plants will grow shallow rooted, um, but it's always better to give the bed enough water. Here it says they need 24 inches on the deep rooted ones. So the, and most of your beds are 12 inches. If you're doing them in a garden bed, the boards are 12 inches, probably are 10. Um, anyhow, so next slide. And so this is the slide showing you the deep, the deep rooted ones and the shallow ones. And this is how you don't want something that's supposed to be deep rooted to have shallow roots. <laughs> it won't hold itself up. You think about how big a tomato plant gets and um, it has to hold itself up. So it needs to go down deep. Uh, and this is also a good time where you could, for the deeply watered ones where you can use the soaker part of the nozzle that would really and just leave it there with the timer on it to get it watered okay next slide watering for containers now that is um we were just talking about this i don't think you guys got the container gardening thing it wasn't in your packet but we have just located the information so i think elizabeth will be able to send this out to you and there's everything you need to know about container gardening in there, including how to water. But if you are watering in containers, they do dry out a lot faster, especially if it's black. Um, so you need to check those every day and sometimes twice a day as, as we get some really high heat. Um, I also sometimes will put um, a container underneath to hold the water. So, cause they, once they dry out, if they dry out too much and you pour water through it, which you should pour water through until it comes out the bottom, but it could be coming out the bottom because it's so dry and it finds runs down. So um, watering, having a saucer at the bottom at that point to allow it to soak up water from the bottom is a good thing. Um, and I think that's it. Questions? Judith, did we get any questions? Not yet. So yeah, if you have questions about watering, uh, let us know. Mostly, I've, uh, the most of the questions I've gotten so far have been about um, planting, <laughs> not about watering. <laughs> but we've been dealing with them on the chat. So for those of you who haven't been reading the chat, if you might wanna check it out and see if there's anything that uh, you're interested in knowing about as well. I have a question um, that maybe is sort of speaking to what Leah was gonna offer, but for folks that are interested in a drip irrigation system or maybe can't visit their garden every day, like folks who have a community garden plot, I'd like to hear some tips or recommendations. Well, one thing is that I think the Leah or who somebody's who's somebody's talking about mulching, right? Yeah, and mulching is a big plus if you're not going to be able to do anything every day. Oh, so um, Malaya has a plot in a community garden. Mm -hmm. Is there a question? No, no question so okay. far. If you have, I mean, one tool that, um, I don't know if it would work at a community garden, but that you can't, there are timers that are manual timers like Ruby showed, but there are also um, timers that you can set with a battery that will make, well, you can say it, have it water your plants every two days. And so um, those tools are great if you're gonna be this is on vacation. Um, that one is one of them. Yeah, that's a battery one. I, you know, and I have some. I have smaller ones in the past. Yeah. I've used single ones and double ones, but and now I just use this because I garden a lot. <laughs> we found one. We found one in the past at Habitat 
for uh, ha the habitat store for like five dollars and um just i think just having some way to get water to your plants when you're out of town even if it's like making friends with your neighbor that has a garden can make the difference between a garden that that thrives and a garden that gets into trouble so um it could be just a human strategy to um to solve the problem of um, taking care of your garden while it, while you're away but in these hot summers um, it's pretty important to be consistent I think. I have one more thought to share on that which is that OSU Extension Small Farms has done a lot of research on dry farming and master gardeners have been studying how this can apply to gardens and we actually have a, a webinar with our horticulture faculty member and the small farms dry farming researcher talking about how home gardeners can use these techniques to get really tasty tomatoes and other sort of warm weather crops with really minimal watering once the plant's established. Mm -hmm. So I will share a link to that webinar in our resources list. So I want to mention something. I did take that web webinar and it seemed to me that you have to have certain seed types. It was only good for certain varieties. That may be the case and yeah, it's a deeper dive than we can take here, but for folks that are interested in that topic, we'll have the resource available. There's also, um, there's also um, a book by, that, by the same author who wrote Gardening West of the Cascades, Steve Solomon. He also wrote a book about dry farming that has some interesting diagrams about how you set up your garden beds um, and which plants really need to be close to the water source and which plants um, would be farther away and could um, could deal with less water. So that is a good resource too. Um, also, if, you're dry, if you think your garden's not going to get as much water, you might space your plants out farther from each other than you would in a regular garden because um, that way they won't be competing with each other for, for the water that you do give them. Okay, we have um, a comment back from Malaya saying that she, when she goes away, she just asks people in the community garden to help uh, when she needs help, which is a great benefit of being in a community garden. Um, and Brianna has a question, which is, what do you recommend for keeping cats out of your dirt? Uh, <laughs> vinegar. <laughs> you can put vinegar on a piece of cloth and put it by your garden beds. I prefer a physical barrier for cats. And I'm going to, when I am talking about ways to keep pests out of garden beds, some of what we'll show is physical barriers that can exclude unwanted animals, including cats. Uh, but that's where I've had the best luck. Also, just having plant cover that covers your whole area um, or having that be your end goal. Cats want to dig in the dirt, and if there's no dirt, then they're less likely to cause trouble. Okay, I guess we can move on to our next topic, which is weeding, and Leah Gorman is going to lead us on that. Oh, my tool. All right. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Leah. Um, I um, am actually not a master gardener by training. I'm just someone who's been growing vegetables for a bunch of years. So um, the picture on the left, that's my garden. And um, I chose this picture myself because that was, I think in my second year of gardening was the year that I really felt like I grew a lot of food and that I could um, really contribute to my um, year's vegetables. And I, I was really, so when I was searching for a picture of myself in my garden, I picked this one out. I'm going to talk to you about weeding, which is not, and weed management, which isn't always everybody's favorite part of gardening. <laughs> um, but I hope we can give you some strategies that will make it a little bit less burdensome, a little bit less work. And honestly, when I'm out there, weeding in my garden. I try to be out there in the summer in the early part of the day or the end of the day when it's not so hot. And I just love being outside of that time of year. It's really beautiful out. And um, so 
as long as I can kind of get comfortable, I actually am pretty happy out there when I'm weeding. So, um, could I get the next slide? So I'm hoping everyone will answer me in the chat. Um, what do you guys think about when you think of a weed? Maybe either give me an example of a weed in the chat if you're using it or um, what you think a weed is. Um, if I could get a few answers. R Judith, would you be willing to read the kind of things as they come up in the chat? Sure, I'm waiting. Oh, okay, here's one. Um, whatever plants I don't want to be growing. Another one is unwanted in the way plants. And Neil another had one. one is anything invasive, grass. Mm -hmm. uh, another one is dandelions, and now I think of invasive, invasive plants as weeds, such as mint. Right, so I think you guys kind of got at the heart of it that, I mean, a weed is ultimately something that uh, you don't want there, and in a garden, it's almost everything except for your vegetables, right? Because you're just trying to provide that ideal environment for your vegetables. Um, but then there are certain plants like um, that grass or mint that have a lot of um, big thick root system that are really a problem for your, um, for your growing plant that they really inhibit its growth. And so some weeds are, seem to take over more and more invasive and, um, than others. Um, can I go to the next slide? I think you guys kind of have the general idea I'm gonna, of, of these next couple of slides, but I'll go through them anyway. So, and Leah, let me just interrupt for a second. We got another comment that some are edible. Right, so some of the plants that, um, that people call weeds, like a dandelion, um, were plants that people were growing um, on purpose in Europe and kind of brought over here with their vegetables and that but these plants were really successful um, in this kind of a disturbed environment um, at growing really fast uh, maybe they made a lot of seeds and um, and so they, they start out as an edible plant but they kind of take over and people start thinking um, they don't want them around um, so yes, and I also see a comment that you can only eat dandelions when they're tender, right? Not every plant is that tasty as it gets older. Um, they are medicinal. <laughs> good to know. Um, so the other reason I should have this slide is just to, to think about a lot of our weeds are really good at spreading by seed, right? They're plants that evolve to be successful because they grow really quickly and then they get a whole lot of seeds out there. So um, you, you want to think in your garden about um, sort of how you can keep those plants from going to seed so that you don't have not only that weed now, but hundreds of seeds to make that weed again next year. Could I get the next slide? Um, somebody also mentioned um, invasive weeds. So um, in a garden, and um, you know, we th use the word invasive, we think about things that take over. And um, some plants are taking over in a garden, but some plants are also um, invasive in natural habitats. And um, bindweed is one of those plants that can be, can take over your garden. It can crawl up your tomatoes and wind around them and um, make it really hard for your tomatoes to um, compete for light, um, but they can also be a problem and take over in natural habitats. And um, some people have asked, um, you know, they'll, they'll be in their garden and they'll wonder like, is this weed that I find, is it a problem just for me in my garden or is it a problem, um, a bigger problem? Um, and so Institute of Applied Ecology put together um, this field guidebook. So um, I wanted to give you this link. I think we're gonna be sharing the slides later um, just to show you that if you have a weed and you wanna look it up and you wanna know how big of a problem it is, it is in our area, this is a resource for you to look, um, to look for. Um, whether so I, do people, different people are going to have a different tolerance for, um, for weeds in their garden, depending on um, your situation, depending on how much time you have, depending on um, 
depending on how big your garden is. Um, and so if you are getting out there and weeding your garden, um, you may want to set some priorities to kind of get into a triage situation the same way um, an emergency room doctor is looking for the biggest problems to solve um, the sickest patients first. Uh, um, a gardener sometimes has to triage their weed, um, their weed problem. And so um, you really do probably want to look for those weeds that are going to seed um, the grasses and those invasive weeds first if you have to prioritize and, um, and then think about everything else. Um, sometimes it's not, it, you know, it's not possible to have a perfect garden, but you just want to be giving your plants the best chance for success. Um, I did want to take a little bit of a step backward in thinking about controlling weeds because getting out there and pulling weeds out is really only um, one piece of controlling weeds. Um, that's a lot of work. And so if you can use some other strategies um, to keep the weeds down in your garden, um, water management is something that I do. So um, I, I think Ruby was just telling you about um, a watering system where you have um, uh, a small amount of water dripping out of um, uh, the drip irrigation system. I use a system like that because when I use overhead watering, like a sprinkler, I'm watering all the weeds. But if I can just have the water go to my plants and not to all the weeds, then I'm going to have a lot less weeds. And that works pretty well for me. Um, I do try to mow around the outside. I, my garden is surrounded by grass, so I do try to keep that down just so that um, I don't have dandelions uh, dumping their weeds into my, um, into my garden. Uh, and using transplants is a, is a big strategy for me. I, even when I start plants from seed, um, I often will start them in the greenhouse or start them in the house and then transplant outside because that way um, I can prepare my garden, have it be um, empty of weeds when I'm putting the transplants in and my plants are much bigger than the weeds around them. And that, so they're not um, fighting it out with all of the weed seeds um, around them. Um, and then you can kind of help the weeds from getting established over the off season using a cover crop if your spot is um, amenable to that. Um, and then people will use um, other materials like buying something like landscape fabric to sort of shade out or smother um, the weeds. Landscape fabric is um, more, more often used for landscaping, but you could use it in a vegetable garden. But I certainly use mulch in my paths um, so that I'm not weeding the paths um, along with the, the, the vegetable beds. Um, with the rest of our time about weeds, I thought um, it would be interesting to find out a little bit about what some of the other master gardeners' favorite approaches to, um, to weeding or their favorite tool. I know my, to my favorite um, garden tool is a long-handled hoe. Um, I like the hoe because I have a big garden and there's just no way I can pull every weed out by hand. So when I, once I put those transplants in the ground, I'm out there with that long-handled hoe. My husband, um, takes it um, and he sharpens it so it's really sharp and you can do that with your garden tools as well. Get them really sharp um, to make it easier to hoe the plants and also easier um, to dig them out. So that's my favorite tool. The other reason I liked it is for that act of what, you call, what I call like leaning on the hoe, which is I think the same thing that Ruby was saying about getting out in my garden every day where I'm doing nothing and uh, checking out what's going on, looking to see what weeds need to be Pulled out the most. <laughs> Judith, were you going to talk about maybe talk about what your favorite uh, garden tool was? I have mine. I think I can't hear you yet. Let me. I was muted. Okay. <laughs> My favorite is a hori hori, which looks like this. I never even knew about hori horis until I became a master gardener 
And then the other master gardeners told me, oh, you need a hori hori. Well, I'm really glad they did because I use it for everything. It's great for uh, transplantings, um, starts into your garden because it just takes up just a little bit of, of earth. And it's great for weeding because it can stick down really, really far and it's really strong. So you don't have to worry about it breaking. Um, but I guess I tend to use it a little bit too much because sometimes when I'm weeding really big areas and I should be using a hoe, I'm really just stuck on using my hori hori and I've actually never even used a hoe. So I, every time I'm doing that, I'm thinking, someday I have to try a hoe. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and then my husband loves to use just one of these plain little, I guess I, I would call it an old fashioned weeder. Um, they're really inexpensive and you can get them in basically any hardware store or garden store. And they also go really deep and they're good um, for just digging out long rooted weeds. So those are my favorites. So, and, and this one is mine. Uh, it's an ergonomic one, which I like. It's, it's also from Radius. It's really long, so it goes down and it can get the, if you don't get the roots, why bother? So um, that's why I like this because it's really long and it's, it, it's, it's something like a hori hori, but it's a little bit more specific and it's easier on your hand. Um, it, and I use, and it also goes in under shallow weeds where you can just lift the whole soil up just like you would with a hori hori, but it's just more specific. It's a, it's a I'd say it's radius, I think it's. Are we ready to share about cover crops? I have a little demo to show for cover crops. Yeah, we, uh, we, we, we talked about this ahead of time and Elizabeth said, well, actually I have a different favorite way to approach reeds. So. <laughs> so we did talk a little bit about covering your soil when your garden is empty. So this would be like a garden bed that you're resting for the winter, whether it's in a, a garden at a community garden or where you live, but straw is a good thing to use. You can use things like newspaper or cardboard if they're held down with rocks. Just keep in mind that slugs do love to hide under cardboard. So watch out if you're mulching around tender plants. Growing a cover crop though is one of my favorite things to protect soil in the winter. The roots help keep the soil washing away from washing away. Uh, it crowds out weeds and then some cover crops even add nitrogen to your soil. So I'm going to show, um, so this is a fava bean. It makes these big black and white flowers that look like tiny triceratops faces. There it is, ghost triceratops. But these make delicious beans that are used in Mexican and Filipino cuisine, among others. And it's also a really wonderful nitrogen fixer. So this one's one that makes beans that you can eat but there's also ones that are more just a cover crop. And I got this big old bag of fava beans at the soil amendment sale put on by 10 Rivers Food Web, uh, which is a local resource for getting access to low cost soil amendments and cover crops. Some other cover crops that are really good include clover. So this one's another nitrogen fixer. Uh, and then I also have uh, Facelia tanacetifolia. This one makes beautiful purple flowers that curl up like the tops of fern fiddleheads. And so that actually brings me to keeping your cover crops from going to seed. Most likely if you have planted a cover crop, you want to plant it to prepare the way for your future vegetable garden. So cut down those cover crops before they start to make seeds because then you'll just be planting more cover crop and it will kind of become a weed. Uh, but especially these nitrogen fixing ones like the clover or the fava bean, those can be mowed down and then kind of tilled into your garden as you're preparing your garden. And then it will decompose in your soil and just add a little bit of extra nitrogen that will benefit your next year's garden. Uh, but yeah, I'm a big fan of the cover crop. That's my share. 
And I think I did not, I'm, sometimes I'm a slow learner, but I just didn't realize how useful it would be to mulch my raised beds over the winter and how much work that would save me in the spring, keeping those weeds from growing out over the winter. So that is one lesson that um, I learned a little late, but has saved me a lot of time recently. Can I add one thing about the clover cover crop? Um, I have a tool. I mean, you have to remove the cover crop when you're ready to plant, and sometimes that can be a hassle. But I found a tool that works really well for just shearing off the clover. Let me see if I can share that with you. Oh, I can't share, I guess. That's all right. <laughs> All right, I think that um, we might want to just go to questions about, just quick questions about, um, are there questions about weeding before we move on to integrated pest management? Uh, we do have some questions. Uh, one of them is, uh, let's see, when do we plant them if we want to use them as a, crop, a cover crop? Well, um, Malaya says to Elizabeth, can you please write in that, the chat where you bought the, the fava bean seeds and when do we plant them if we want to use them as a cover crop? And a similar question is, um, okay, so the cover crop is specifically for wintering over. No, you can do summer ones too. Buckwheat. Okay, so they're different crops for summer and winter? Yes. And I think that Elizabeth said that she bought the cover crop at the um, at the sale, the fertilizer sale that happens once a year in February for the Ten Rivers Food Web, which is a wonderful resource. Um, however, if you were trying to find a cover crop seed um, at this time of year, other nurseries might have it. I know um, Nichols um, Nursery often will have it in bulk, and that's a low cost way to buy cover crop seed. I think they all do. This is Elizabeth again. If you find yourself in the Portland area, Concentrates Nursery is a place that's sort of a wholesaler, but the public is welcome to buy things there as well. And they have a lot of these things in bulk as well for a low cost. I'm sorry, where? Oh, Concentrates Supply in Portland. And here's another question. I inherited raised beds when I moved a couple months ago. Someone had planted mint in them and I tried to get it out by the roots, but I'm sure they are there and am concerned if they will stump the growth of my fruits and veggies. This is my first garden. I am going to go ahead and plant and keep on top of it. Any ideas? Keeping on top of it, it's good. Mm -hmm. And I would just dig really well that first time and pull out as many of those roots as you can. <laughs> if you're going to keep that soil, just, um, just be as thorough as you can. And another thing you can do is every time you see a little mint guy coming up, um, just pull it out mm -hmm. and it won't hurt your vegetables. I've struggled with mint as a weed and I would almost... I would give it a try, but if the mint comes roaring back and really overwhelms your veggies, I would almost think twice about maybe trying to garden in a different place or trying to replace the soil in those beds if there's a time in the future when that's more of a possibility for you. But give it a try and see what happens. Okay, here's another question from Brianna. Um, okay, so help me understand, in the summer, the cover crop uses up soil to prevent the weeds. Um, can you explain a little more about how the cover crop works? Yeah, I mean, so the cover crop is basically just a plant like any other plant, but when the cover crop is growing thickly across your surface, it's taking up water and soil nutrients that otherwise weeds would be crowding in for. A lot of these weeds like Leah was sharing are really well adapted to grow in disturbed areas. And what is a garden if not a disturbed area, right? We're always digging there or pulling out 
um, unwanted plants. So if there's bare soil, weeds will, will pretty much come. So the cover crop just fills the space that weeds would otherwise be. Okay, and one last quick question before we have to move on. Uh, what, so what time of year or month is it best to plant fava bean seeds as a cover crop? Now I'm like, I need to look that one up. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head when we actually planted these. And in fact, my spouse planted them this year. So I need to look back at the timing. Do any other instructors here know when to plant them? I know it's- I've planted them in the fall and then I've also overwintered some beans had stayed there and then they came up. So I like fava beans because um, you can actually plant them a little later um, as a cover crop. Clover, mm -hmm. I've um, found that you have to put clover in pretty much by September in order to get it to germinate. Um, uh, and peas, uh, Austrian peas are a good cover crop if you can get it in, get them in in September. Um, but fava beans, um, this year I didn't get them in until October and they did fabulous. So they're really, favas are the best cooler germinating cover crop that I've found in this area. Um, some people will use a mix of um, seeds that uh, you can get a, a mix like in bulk so that you, you're kind of covered. One thing out of the mix, one or two things might germinate and you, um, can get a nice cover crop that way too. But uh, personally, um, favas are my favorite um, because of the germination factor. Um, and uh, Elizabeth did say, um, be sure to um, cut them down early. Don't let them get too big. I did one year let them get too big and it, it took much longer for them to break down. So right now, I didn't get mine as in as early. So they're about knee high. And when I want to plant tomatoes and summer crops um, um, in May, I'll, I'll probably knock them down a couple weeks before I want to actually plant through them. And one last point about the summer cover crops. Um, even though they're growing in summer, they're, they're something that you would put on a bed that you are not planting with your main vegetable crop. So maybe some years I just have a raised bed I'm not going to plant at all that for some reason. And so that's where I'd put that summer cover, cover crop. Um, I wouldn't be planting it in, this, in the bed that I'm actively, um, I'm actively using. It's also good if people do an early um, bed, or, you know, so like peas and some, and lettuces, kale, something like that. And then they rest it for the summer and they can put buckwheat in then, and then they do a fall planting like garlic or anything else that you can think of, Paul. Well, with that, I think I'm gonna uh, take us to our next topic. So lots of really good questions about weed management, but now we're gonna talk about another problem in the garden, which would be pests and diseases. So um, I'm Elizabeth, I'm an extension staff person that works for the Home Horticulture and Master Gardener program. And right. it's my privilege to work with a bunch of these really excellent folks that are here tonight. So when we talk about dealing with pests and diseases in the garden, we're really thinking about it in terms of integrated pest management or IPM. Uh, gosh, I'm hearing some noise in the background. I'm going to... Would one of my co-hosts please find uh, where the chatter is coming from and, and mute. Thank you. Uh, so integrated pest management or IPM is really just kind of thinking through the situation when there's a problem, disease or pest in our garden and really tailoring the solution to the problem. So for prevention, we would focus on cultural controls and that could be as simple as like cleaning up fallen plant material that pests could hide in or reproduce in. Then we could use mechanical methods and that could be something as simple as picking slugs off of a plant. Biological controls would be building habitat for beneficial insects that eat pests that we want to get rid of. And then sometimes we do resort to chemical controls when other methods don't work out, but we do want to use those really carefully and cautiously. 
So for integrated pest management, there's sort of a little cycle that we go through. Um, master gardeners and farmers and people who work in horticulture like to think about it as a cycle. So we start by evaluating the situation. We kind of check out our garden and see what's, what's going on. Is there, is there any problem in our garden that could be a pest or a disease? Then if we notice something, like maybe we notice that there's a, a plant with a hole in the leaf, we monitor. So maybe we check out that plant every day or every few days and see if the problem gets worse. So maybe we notice a few more holes in the leaf. Then we try to identify what's the cause. So can you, can you catch the culprit red-handed or is it still kind of a, a mystery? Um, chances are if there's an insect that's making that hole, you might see the insect or you might see um, poop that it leaves behind or other signs of its presence. So once we've identified what's causing the issue, well, think about our tolerance level, right? Maybe just a few holes in my leaf of kale. Uh, I'll still eat that kale leaf, but maybe if that kale leaf looks like a slice of Swiss cheese, I'm going to think again because I want to eat that kale. I don't want the insects to eat it all. So then I move to management. I'm going to try some of the methods that I outlined in the last slide, and I'm going to start with sort of the more gentle ones or kind of trying to get out ahead of the problem by things like cultural control and work my way up to deciding if, yeah, maybe I'm going to try mechanical removal or try a biological control. And then maybe I'll think about a pesticide if all other methods fail. So once I've done my management, then I'm going to repeat the cycle again. I'll evaluate and see if my management made any difference in getting rid of that pest, and then I'll take next steps to continue the cycle. So there's many, many plant diseases, and we don't have the ability to go over most of them here tonight, but a plant disease or a nutritional deficiency like the calcium deficiency that's happening with these tomatoes. Um, this would be some sort of damage where maybe there's, there's not an obvious insect pest, but the plant just looks unhealthy. Um, often there will be like spots or a funny texture on the leaves or the fruit. And I will say that the Master Gardener Volunteer Help Desk is available currently by email and phone and by the Ask an Expert platform online. And then when the public health situation improves, once again, face to face. Uh, but if you have a, a plant question that you're not sure what's going on, whether it's an insect or a disease, you can bring it to Master Gardeners in Extension and we'll help troubleshoot it for you. So we did talk about having a, a tolerance level with pests. Again, is it really a problem? Sometimes people are just sort of tuned to think of a particular insect as a problem and then they want to immediately like grab for the nearest pesticide, but maybe that's not really necessary. So some of it is kind of asking yourself, how much of a priority is this? And then kind of weighing the, the benefits and the uh, risks as you decide what's an appropriate next step. So when we're thinking about prevention, here's a gardener who's checking their garden for insect damage. So this gardener is like turning over their leaves to check and see are there aphids or other insect pests uh, attached to those leaves. Just kind of keeping an eye on things in your garden as often as you can make it out into your garden is good for getting out ahead of the pests before they multiply to a point where it does become a bigger problem. But if you have just a few pests and you can catch them early, then you have a better chance to control it using less, uh, less challenging methods. And then protecting your plants when they're young and small. So these gardeners have a creative solution that's a little bit like something Ruby showed. They've cut the bottom off of a plastic bottle and they're using it as a little cover for a brand new plant that's freshly planted into the garden. So these are young plants that would be vulnerable to like an insect coming along and just chomping the whole plant down to the ground. Sometimes new gardeners will plant seeds or plant out in new young starts and then find that they like magically vanish overnight. And nobody wants to have that experience. 
uh, but keeping those pests away with just a physical barrier like this is a creative option. Also note that they've uh, taken the caps off the bottles so that the plant can breathe under there and doesn't get too hot. So we're gonna talk about physical controls, which would just be removing the problem. This can be as simple as reaching in there and removing the pest by hand. So if you can see like this little slug taking a bite out of your plant, you could just grab it off and put it in a bucket of soapy water uh, to kill it. That would be a possible option. You could also use a strong stream of water to blast insects off of leaves and this would work well with insects that like cling to the underside of the leaf and their lifestyle is pretty much just to stick to the leaf right it's not insects that are on the move but it's ones that just hang out um, and hide out on the leaf so this is blasting those insects off where they can't eat the plant some other physical controls to think about so there's a blue jay in my neighborhood that knows when I'm out planting seeds and the blue jay when I'm done in the garden will like fly down and go where I planted and dig up the seeds that it likes to eat. So like sunflower seeds are a big hit with my blue jay friend. Um, so birds, many types of birds are not fond of shiny objects. So here's a gardener putting a scratched old CD out in their garden to reflect the light and scare the bird into thinking that maybe there's a predator there. And other things like, like shiny streamers can work too. Um, at my mom's house, there's a woodpecker that wants to dig into the wooden siding because um, that's just what it does, right? It just wants to hammer, hammer on the wooden siding of her house to attract other woodpeckers. And she uses shiny streamers to scare them away. Some other controls to think about would be a barrier. So somebody was asking about cats getting into their garden earlier. And we can also think about insect pests that take a bite out of plants. And so in the picture on the top right hand side is a white cover over a garden row. So that's a, a special gardening fabric. And one brand name of that is called Rime. And that's a fabric that can sort of exclude pests but it also kind of lets the plants breathe and keep cool. So especially if you have new young plants, putting this row cover over the top of them while they start to develop and get a little bit bigger is a good way to protect them from pests that would just go in there. I will say that I've seen deer like poke a hole in this type of fabric to eat plants that they want. And that's something good to think about if you live in an area with any sorts of um, wildlife around. Deer can be pretty urban, and I live at the junction of um, Highway 20 and a major road, and there's still deer that get up in my garden. Uh, so another thing to think about is a more robust barrier. In the picture on the lower right, there's a gardener laying out some chicken wire over the surface of their soil to protect uh, seeds. So something like that would be something to use maybe against that blue jay or against a cat that just wants to use the garden as a litter box, but then you could also prop it up over a taller plant um, and put it on a frame or something. So there's quite a lot of plans out there for, for garden beds that are protected with a mesh when there's really intense pressure from animals wanting to get in and eat those yummy veggies. So then biological controls and Earlier, Leah showed a slide that was a picture of her garden and you saw at the ends of her rows some brightly colored flowers. And one purpose of having flowers like that sort of on the border of the garden can be to attract beneficial insects. So when we talk about a beneficial insect, we're thinking about the type of insect that really likes to feast on unwanted pests. So this praying mantis will eat large quantities of insects that gardeners find to be pests. And there are a number of others that we're going to introduce you to in a little game in a moment here. But creating habitat for these beneficial insects is one of the best things you can do for yourself as a gardener, because these insects will kill pests so you don't have to. And then chemical controls if all else fails. So 
at the Master Gardener Help Desk fairly often, we are hearing from folks who say something like, I found this bug, I don't know what it is, but what can I spray to get rid of it? And from our perspective, it's like, no, 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 that might be a, a beneficial insect. Don't get rid of your beneficial insect. And further, don't go using a, a chemical that might be, that might have unnecessary risks to people, pets, wildlife, or the environment when maybe doing something like just putting up with a few holes in your kale or handpicking some insects could solve your problem. Uh, but sometimes there are situations where we decide this is what makes sense. We do suggest that if you're thinking about applying a pesticide to your garden to check in with the Master Gardener Help Desk or with the National Pesticide Information Center. And both those groups can kind of counsel you through deciding what's the most appropriate action for your garden, kind of given your unique situation. So one example of a situation where I would consider a chemical control would be like we saw a picture earlier of a teeny tiny slug perched on someone's hand. And those slugs are so small, they're kind of hard to see. And so that's a situation where if I had really new young plants, like radishes from seed, like I just planted, I would think about sprinkling around some iron phosphate. And one brand name of that is Sluggo. But that basically just dries the slugs out when they eat it. And the risk to people, pets, and wildlife is low. Um, you wouldn't want to go eating sluggo from the jar, and you wouldn't want your dog or your toddler to get into it and eat it, but the risk is pretty low to apply it to your garden. So that's just one consideration. And Elizabeth, in the, in the book, there are a few examples like that of, of, um, of situations where you might use something there where there is an organic method. Um, if please please go use. on yeah so i just Fill it's just in. somewhere i just so it's just somewhere that people that people can look i think it's in this same chapter about caring for your growing garden um but some examples like sluggo or like neem oil things that people might use that um, before going to um, synthetic pesticides totally one thing to consider is people will often think that if it says that it's organic or natural that it's safe and safety is pretty relative. Um, so yeah, read and follow the label. The label is the law, um, even on something that's like insecticidal soap, right? It's a product that's pretty benign, but you still wouldn't want to, wouldn't want to get it in your eye, for instance. So yeah, just a few considerations with chemical controls. So now we're gonna play a game that's called Good Bug, Bad Bug. And this is gonna introduce you to a few, um, both beneficial insects and pests. So we've discussed some of these insects already and some of them might be familiar, but some of them might be new. So what I'm gonna do is you'll view a picture of the insect, then I'll bring up a poll that you can respond to and let us know, do you think it's a good bug or a bad bug? And here we're using the term bug loosely. Uh, it could be, other types of creatures as well as true bugs. And then we'll look and sort of see the reveal, um, whether this is a bug that gardeners should welcome or not, and some tips to either get rid of the insect or attract it if it's a beneficial insect. So let's try, let's try a sample one. So here's a picture of a ladybug. And I'll just give you this one. There are two ladybugs in this picture. So good bug or bad bug? Can you see the poll? Go ahead and pick, pick a choice. No poll. So if you're not seeing a poll, you can uh, type your thoughts about it into the chat box and I'll continue to work on making the poll uh, function. Oh, I see some people voting. Definitely some people are voting. So if you don't have your, your polling box, uh, you're more than welcome to mention it in the chat box. So I'm gonna close the poll and end the poll. So here's how you voted. A bunch of people said good bug, but a few people said bad bug. So let's look at the answer. So 
So ladybugs are a beneficial insect to have. And actually in this picture, there's both a larval ladybird or lady beetle and an adult. And they really will feed on aphids, mealybugs, and spider mites. And to attract these insects to your garden, have flowers that produce pollen and nectar. And you could also consider spraying on whey and yeast to your plants. I've never tried the whey and yeast thing. I find that if I have aphids, usually there's some ladybugs on the scene. All right, how are you feeling about this good bug, bad bug? Ready for another one? Cabbage worms, good bug or bad bug? Here comes the pull. All right, I see people voting. We'll give it, give it about five more seconds. So the vote is in. People are saying that this is a bad bug. And in fact, the picture is kind of a spoiler. You can see where they took a bite out of this cabbage leaf. Uh, but yes, cabbage worms um, will feed on plants in the cabbage family, and they will eat a hole right in the leaf. So one way to control these is to remove plant debris, like old leaves that have fallen off your crops. That's places where these insects can hide and reproduce. You can also use row covers uh, to protect young plants. And then you can go in and grab those green worms off of there if you can see them. All right, next bug up, the green lacewing. Here comes your poll. Green lacewing, good bug or bad bug? Give it a few more seconds. And closing the poll. All right, it looks like most people reported that this would be a good bug. And it is indeed a good bug. So these are pretty distinctive little critters. They're that really vivid bright green color. And the, ling the wings really do look lacy and quite beautiful. They're rather small. Um, so adults and larvae feed on aphids, insect eggs, spider mites, white flies, and small caterpillars. So wow, that's a lot for a little bug. And then how do you attract them? Plant flowers that produce pollen and nectar. All right, next one up, flea beetles. Good bug or bad bug? Good bug or bad bug? Give it about five more seconds. And done. All right, it looks like 100% of participants thought that this little guy, this little tiny flea beetle with the red arrow pointing to him is a bad bug. And the picture kind of gave it away. So yeah, these ones will really descend on new young plants. They really love my arugula and radishes. Um, and they make it look like somebody's used the plant for target practice. And they jump like fleas, so you can't catch them and just pick them off. So yeah, larger plants are less vulnerable to them, although I have had transplants really chewed up when I have a heavy infestation. So I find the best thing to do is to use a floating row cover, like that white remake cloth, when I have brand new plants out there and that will help keep the flea beetles away. All right, next one up, centipede. Take a good look at the centipede, and now we'll have the poll run again. And you can vote centipede, good bug or bad bug? Oh, we'll have about five more seconds. So more people, about 70% thought this was a bad bug, but about 30% thought it was a good bug. So we're going to see the results. So these are ones that are actually really beneficial to gardeners. They prey on pests and insects in the soil. 
including slugs, worms, and fly pupa. And they also are decomposers that help uh, decompose organic matter in the soil. So yeah, if you're turning over a compost pile, you'll find centipedes. And also if you practice less tillage in your gardening, right? Um, digging things up less, that's going to protect that habitat for these beneficial insects. Just a time check with my fellow presenters, but I see that I'm uh, close to the end of my time here. Do you want to do one more bug? Let's just do one more bug and then we'll... Uh... I think you're fine. Um, okay. Why don't you just finish up and then if there's, um, if there's not as much time for questions, we can always get back to people through the root cellar. We do have lots of questions waiting. Just to let you know. <laughs> we'll leave a little time for questions. We'll do, do a few more. And I will let folks know that if this activity is fun for you, that um, in your email is a link to a handout that has a whole lot more of these. All right. So here's an easy one for you. Slugs. <laughs> Good bug or bad bug. You can see them kind of having fun here and partying. All right. Good bug or bad bug? Yeah, I'm just gonna end the poll because I think this one's pretty clear, but if you're a brand new gardener, maybe you've never, never experienced what slugs can do to a garden. Remember how I talked about plants vanishing overnight like by bad magic? It's a slug. It's in the belly of a slug. So yeah, one thing you can do to to remove slugs is to consider putting out a trap made with beer or yeast. I like to keep my beer for myself, but in one of our extension resources called Growing Your Own, there's a recipe for a concoction you can make with yeast and sugar that will attract slugs to drown in a little container that you plant in the ground. So we can share that recipe with you. And yeah, have, these, oh, go I, on. Elizabeth, I have two strategies for slugs that aren't on there. One is I keep ducks in my garden pen area <laughs> during the year when I'm not growing a garden and they eat all the slug eggs and all the slugs. So by nice. the time I plant, they're gone. And then the other one I use is I plant late because often you don't have to put your plants in as early as possible. And if it's not as wet out, you're not going to get as many slugs. In the past, I've had ducks, and one thing that I found was really good was you can use the trap board. So like if you have a plank that you place in the garden, the slugs will attach to the underside, and then you flip it over and the ducks come running. Currently, I have chickens because they leave less mud than the ducks did, and the chickens are not that interested in slugs, but they are interested in slug eggs. So when I take out my garden for my summer garden in preparation for my fall garden, the chickens are right there, kind of walking behind me and eating slug eggs that get turned up in the soil. All right, here's one more for you. Yellow jackets, good bug or bad bug? And in this case, we'll think about, think about this from a plant's point of view, right? We know that humans don't really want to snuggle up to a yellow jacket, but yeah, good bug or bad bug from a plant's point of view. Just a couple more seconds. So you voted for, that it's a good bug and the answer is that yes, it is from a plant's point of view, right? Again, you don't really want a nest that's right on your garden path. Some people can have a really strong allergic reaction to these insects, however, they eat other wasps, they eat caterpillars, flies and beetle grubs. So if they're not bothering you, if there's just one around, there's no need to worry about it too much. There's a chance that it's playing a valuable part in your garden's ecosystem. All right, aphids, good bug or bad bug? A few more seconds. Uh, I think our gardeners have done their homework or else you've experienced what aphids can do. So you voted that the aphid is a, a bad bug. And yeah, so these are these little squishy insects that attach to the plant and suck out the juices. We talked about how attracting 
ladybugs and beneficial insects like green lacewings is a good way to, to start to get rid of these. Um, you can also spray these with insecticidal soap. And one question that does come up for us pretty often is, can you just use a solution of dish soap? And because dish soap ingredients vary and not all of them are, uh, are studied, so we don't really know their effect on plants or people or the environment, we try to encourage folks when they come to Master Gardeners to get a soap that's labeled specifically for getting insects off of plants, like you can get at a nursery store. All right, got another one for you, cabbage maggots. There's the cabbage maggot. Cabbage maggot, good bug or bad bug? Couple more seconds. So most of our participants, all of our participants voted bad bug. And yeah, so these guys feed on the roots of plants in the cabbage family, broccoli, cauliflower, and it might, you might know that they're there because the growth of the plant is looking stunted. Uh, you won't necessarily see them because they're down there feeding on the root. But these creatures live and reproduce in plant debris. So when your garden is, your summer garden is getting done, if you can clean up any fallen plant debris, you're helping to get rid of them. And then you can also use row covers on young plants to keep them from getting in. This also suggests keeping wild mustard away from your garden. So this would be like a weedy plant in the mustard family. Probably it has little yellow flowers. And this is a place where these cabbage maggots can hang out and then move to garden plants. So yeah, get rid of that wild mustard. And then I'm just going to give you one more here. This is a fun one to end with. Minute pirate bug, good bug or bad bug? A oh, oh, couple more seconds. All right, closing the poll. So 78% voted good bug and 22% voted bad bug. So let's take a look. So this is a really beneficial insect to have. It has that kind of distinctive little tuxedo pattern on it. And they feed on all sorts of unwanted insects, including those corn earworms, where you like peel back the corn husk and somebody else has already eaten the corn. So those corn earworms are favorite food of these pirate bugs. The pirate bug also eats aphids, spider mites, insect eggs, and small caterpillars. So consider planting some of those flowers that make pollen and nectar in order to have these pirate bugs around. So with that, I'm going to end our session of good bug, bad bug. We had a couple of fun ones that we missed here, but we just missed a couple. And yeah, we have, have just a couple moments for some questions. And yeah, on your screen, you can see an overview of all the good stuff we'll be covering next week together with Carol about harvesting and enjoying what we harvest from our class. Carol's with the Master Food Preserver Program and also Master Gardener, so I think it's going to be really wonderful. So we have uh, just a few moments for some questions. Okay, so one of the questions comes from way back. Um, Brianna wants to know, can you know ahead of time if, say, your tomatoes have enough calcium? That's a good question. Is there anyone here who's really familiar with dealing with tomato blossom end rot and can speak to calcium in your soil as a way to solve that problem? Well, I do know that um, I've had blossom end rot in the past and so have some friends of mine. And if you overwater your tomatoes, that's one way that you're kind of leaching out the calcium. And also if you put in too much nitrogen, then it can um, counter, have a counter effect on the calcium. So if you're, when you're using fertilizer on your tomatoes, uh, make sure that it's a fertilizer that's for tomatoes. And they usually, tomato fertilizers will have some calcium in, in them as well. 
Another thing about blossom and rub that's not about the calcium is just that not every variety of tomato is as susceptible to blossom and rot. So if you're having a problem in your spot, you might do a little research to see if you can find a variety of tomato that you could pick to put in there um, that the next year that doesn't have such a problem with blossom and rot. Okay, another question that has to do with what you said, Elizabeth, about using yeast and whey. Uh, which kind of yeast, nutritional or bread yeast? That's a really good question. And honestly, these slides came to me with this suggestion. I'm guessing that it's bread yeast, but I'd like to verify that and respond to it in a follow-up. Okay. Um, and what are some good examples of pollen and nectar plants? Oh my gosh, there's so many options. Yeah. So earlier today, I was watching a webinar from the Oregon Flora Project. And next, like in June, they're coming out with a web app or a website that's helping gardeners pick native plants that are well suited to their site and also matching their color scheme and all sorts of wonderful things. So I will point to where that will live in the future in our resource list. Uh, how about others of you, are there ones that you'd specifically like to share? I'll just add a few more thoughts on pollen and nectar plants. I'm really a big fan of native plants. And in past, I've worked as a restoration technician. And almost all native plants to Oregon are going to have some benefits to insects that you want to have around the garden. One of my favorites is Douglas Aster. And it's that little mm. purple one um, that is just kind of like a little starburst. But those bloomed into November for me last year. and. They can kind of flop and fall over, but remember that praying mantis picture? So I had a praying mantis like move into my Douglas Aster. <laughs> but um, definitely I saw all sorts of beneficial insects swarming it as well. So that would be one example of a really wonderful native plant that provides that late season pollen resource. Um, okay, and then another question is, are there any bug examples you can think of that are beneficial for some crops but detrimental to others? So it would be dependent on what you are growing to determine treatment. That's a good question. I can't immediately think of one. Yeah, I couldn't. Any either. other instructors have a perspective on it? Probably such an insect exists, but I can't immediately think of it. Uh, Okay, and somebody else wanted to know if centipedes sting. It depends on the centipede, and there's yeah. definitely some kinds that sting. Like I was actually looking for a picture for this slide, and I found a picture of a house centipede, and they eat all sorts of pests that live in the home. So this is basically a beneficial insect, but yes, they can sting. So I would say I'm not sure about the centipede that lives in the garden. I probably wouldn't handle it or like give it to a child to hold or something, but I don't think it would just come up on you and sting you. I think probably it's pretty harmless. Um, somebody else wants to know about how do you check your soil pH, which is a different topic, but I think we've mentioned this previously that you can get a free pH test on your soil at the Master Gardener uh, help desk, which is not open right now because of COVID-19, but when it is open, you can bring in um, a sample of your soil in a little plastic bag and they will uh, let you know what your pH is. Um, anything else? Oh, m asters. So you would just plant, say, asters around the periphery of the garden mixed among the veggies? Yeah, so there's actually some research from OSU's own garden ecology lab about some different schemes for planting native plants in a garden and where they attract the most insects. And so basically the answer is it varies. 
um, but we can share some additional research and resources. We're pretty much in the closing moment of our yes, we are. class for tonight. And if anybody else had something they really wanted to share, I was just going to open it up. Hi, this is Dodai. Hi, Dodai. Um, I have a honeysuckle. I um, like the smell and, and then the hummingbirds love it. Um, but every year it gets swarmed by aphids. And I've tried spraying the, um, the soap on it. And I don't know, I, I don't really see a whole lot of ladybugs, but, but they're just like covered in it. It doesn't seem to do any good. Yeah, that's a good question. It's possible that the amount of aphids is so great that there's just managed to be some that survive the soap treatment. It's also possible that maybe the, the soap treatment isn't um, labeled for use on aphids. They, they do vary. So I would need to know a little bit more about what product you're using. That would be a good thing to ask the National Pesticide Information Center or um, put in the question chat box and we can look into it a little bit more for you. Okay, I think I'm missing the, the, the question chat box. Do I come on to this meeting when we're not meeting and, and use chat or is there something else? Ah, so I'm not sure what device you're on, Dodai, but somewhere there should be a cartoon of a little um, speech bubble and that yes. should bring up for you a box where participants are chatting. But you could also respond to the email that I sent you yesterday with your question and we can kind of take it from there behind the scenes. Okay, thank you. Perfect, thank you. Well, with that, I'm gonna say it's been such a fun evening with all of you. It's been a really lively conversation in the chat. And next week, I'm sorry, on Thursday, usually we teach this class on a weekly basis, but our last class in this four class series is happening this coming Thursday, this week. Uh, join us for harvesting and using your bounty.